Hello and good day to you. This is Adam with the Cloud Automation Blog and in today's video, I'm going to be going over HP Operations Orchestration or as it's referred to HPOO or as, as to some of my colleagues refer to it as HPU. Um, so this is, this is HP's uh, orchestrator. Um, what we're looking at right now is the design canvas for a Git weather uh, workflow I've created. I would say HPOO is probably my favorite orchestration engine. It's not widely adopted for various reasons, which I won't go into, but the engine itself it is very, very good. And I'll go into some of the some of the cool features around HPOO and what it provides for the end user. And it's actually very, very easy to use. So on the left, you can see this is the this is more or less the project with the folders. So I just have one workflow just below that within the library are all of the out of the box workflows and actions you can drag onto a canvas. So a lot of these come with a content pack. So you can see these are the actual content packs. The majority of these are in the base content pack. So if I do library, you'll see under operations, a lot of them are here and that's the ones we'll be using. But there's all these other ones that they've actually released since I've really been using the product day to day. So Jenkins, there's middleware ones, IAS application servers, so WebLogic, Citrix, JBoss, Tomcat, WebSphere, all kinds of really cool stuff. But in this video, we're just gonna focus on a very simple workflow around an HTTP REST client Git operation. So to start up the workflow, what you're gonna to wanna to do is drag something onto the workflow. And in this case, you can see right here, this green border means that's where the workflow is gonna start. So I can actually right click here and set start step and you'll see the green will jump, but this throws an error saying the step is unreachable. So I'm gonna change that back. So this is where I'm prompting the user. So field one is the input and it says prompt user for text and the question mark. So it's prompt user and the user message is zip code. So what's really cool about HPOO is there's all these, this is all predetermined. This is something that HP has designed. You actually don't need to code any of this. It's pretty much saying you can have as many inputs as you want. So I can add more inputs and it will add, you know, that other input. I can delete that. I can add results, display, description. It's a description of the actual activity. If there's anything advanced with that workflow and if you wanted to add a scriptlet to that. So in this one, we're just going to do an input and then we actually have a result. So the result is the zip code from input field one, and then the API key is in from input field two. Now, one thing that's different about this tool than uh, some of the other ones is there's no there's no attribute. So I, if I actually wanted to use this 8D94, which is the authentication key for the weather API, I have to use it locally or I can use it globally. So there are global properties right here. So I can actually add that API key here and then that can be used throughout this workflow. For this example, I just added it right at the start, but I'm not actually prompting the user. So you can see it's not required and I'm not prompting the user. I'm actually using a constant. So you can have other options, use constant, prompt user, previous result, system account, or, or some credentials. Um, or you could actually assign it from a previous value, maybe something that was passed in or something that was derived in a previous step. The next thing we do is the actual, the REST client. I just would drag this onto the canvas so you can see the different options. In this case, we did an HTTP client Git version 2.0. And these are all the inputs. As you can see, none of them are assigned. So you could actually use these, but in this case, I'm just using the URL. And you can see here, again, I'm using a constant. But if you look, you'll see it's the full, it's the full URL, but I'm using dollar sign bracket zip code and then dollar sign bracket API key. And those are the actual variable names that it's, that it's getting from the actual overall workflow, but it's pulling it from here. So you can see the result is the API key and the zip code. And that's what we're referencing right here. So out of the HTTP REST, the next, there's another result. So the name of the variable that I'm outputting is called return result. And I'm returning it from return result result field. So again, they've pre-coded all of these, the session ID, the failure message, um, if it's timed out, the actual result, the return code, all these things are pre-coded ready for you. So if you wanted to capture a couple of these, let's just say you wanted the return code for some reason. If you wanted to return code, you could literally just type the name of the variable and then the status code. For this, we don't need that, so I'm going to delete that. But this name is very important because we're going to use this in the next step. So it's return result and we're actually getting that return result from the field return result. And I'm going to overwrite that. So now I actually need to get the temperature and get the city out of the JSON because what this is going to respond with is either some XML or some JSON. In this case, it's JSON. So I need to get the temperature and this is another operator that they've provided to us. So if I go over here to operations, I'm going to go to utility operators. I'm then going to click containers, JSON, and you can see again, they've 
pre-coded all of these for you. So you literally just pass something in and it will spit it out automatically. So that's pretty cool. So if we check out this get temp, you can see the input, the object is the return result. And that's the name of the variable that we're getting from this HTTP REST. If you remember from this HTTP REST get action or activity. So we're gonna pass that in. And the key we're looking for is main.temp and that's the actual JSON path for what we're looking for. In the result, we can see I'm returning a very simple variable name called temp. Moving on to get city, we're doing the very same thing. So we're inputting from that same return result, that same JSON text, and we're looking for the JSON path name and the return on that will be the city. And the very last thing we're doing is we're displaying a message. Again, another out of the box option. The message is a constant, so you can say use constant. And the constant value is the temperature in the city. Again, we're using those same variable names, but now we're getting the variable names from the get temp and get city. And then the last step is we need a resolve success, or if at any time during this operation it failed, we actually need to error failure. So this is pretty cool as well. With these operations, these out of the box operations, they all have a success and failure state. And it's aware of that. So if it was to fail, you can then capture that failure either here, let's say create an incident or email the end user or, or report somehow, or it's gonna return a failed state. So now to debug this workflow and actually see what it does. If you click this little button up here, that will bring up the debugger. And all we wanna do is click play it's gonna ask us for that zip code. So it's that input. So I'm gonna type in, click continue. And it says the temperature in Beverly Hills is 74.71 today. Another thing that's really neat about this debugger, again, this is all built in, is I can go through all these different steps. So this step, we know that it was asking for the zip code. So we can see here, raw result, the primary result, which is what we asked for, and then other results, which are pretty much everything captured is the API key and the zip code. And we can go all the way down through that. So the HTTP REST client, the return result was actually the JSON, the get temp, the temp was the degree, the get city, the city was Beverly Hills. The display message obviously didn't actually have a return result as it was a prompt, but it used all of that data that was collected over the previous four steps. I hope this helped. If you have any questions, feel free to comment, like the video and subscribe. Thank you.